Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, December 3rd, 2017. St. John's is located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. Our telephone number is 937-7508. Come, O Come, Emmanuel, a very old hymn. It was 1710, it was translated. It's from the 15th century. The melody is a French melody, and the words are a Latin hymn. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, first Sunday of Advent. This is the 3rd of December, 2017. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
Secretary, page 147 in the front of your worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit is with you all. And also with you.
every way you have been enriched in him, in speech, in knowledge of every kind. Just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord.
plan on doing that. When my parents passed and retired, he sent out a letter a year ahead of time, so they had a whole year to prepare for his retirement and get things rolling for call committee and all that kind of thing. So who's ever spreading a rumor? I have to tell you, you know, I am not retiring. I have no plan of retiring. Uh, so that means no one needs to be said. So let us now give our attention to our
This time you may take out your sermon notes that you have in your bulletin. And once you have them, you can immediately turn them over and use the Bible to take notes. Because those were the sermon notes for the sermon I thought I was going to preach this morning. But I went to Forge Glen on Friday, and the sermon that goes with those sermon notes isn't what came out at Forge Glen. And the Holy Spirit told me this was the sermon I was supposed to preach. The Holy Spirit also said to me, He said, John, he said, it seems like in past weeks you've lost some of your passion used to have. So get out of that crow's nest you preach from and get among the people and get that passion back in delivering God's word. So grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. There was a New England Baptist preacher who had studied the Bible for 14 years and come up with when he thought Jesus was going to return. He was convinced it was going to be in the year 1843. So he made this proclamation and with it gathered a large following. April 3rd came along and some people went up on mountaintops so they'd have a quicker trip to heaven. Some went to the graveyard and stood among graves of loved ones so they could go to heaven with their loved ones. Some of the society ladies of Philadelphia decided that they didn't want to go to heaven with all the common people in Philadelphia, so they went several miles out of the city into a field where they could all go up together in their snobbery. Well, April 4th arrived, and nothing had happened. So Miller went back to calculate. He decided that Jesus was going to come on March 21st, 1844. Once again, people did all of this, going to mountain cemeteries and so forth, and then March 22nd arrived. So then he gave it one more shot. October 22nd, definitely, this is the day Jesus returned. October 23rd arrived, nothing had happened. So Miller basically withdrew from any leadership or whatever in those who were following him. But his actions gave birth to what we know in America today as the Adventist movement. It is where the Seventh-day Adventist came from. A denomination that emphasizes the return of Jesus Christ and speculating about their return. And ever since, it seems like in America, a decade does not pass that we don't have someone claiming that they know when Jesus is returning. Just a couple of years ago, there was that fellow out in California that claimed he knew exactly when Jesus was returning. And he prophesied when it would be, and of course the day came and nothing happened. So then he made a new date, but he died before that date arrived. Of course that date arrived, we're still here. <coughs> when I was first ordained in the LCA in 1978, first parish was in Evansville, Indiana. And in 1979, a local preacher in Evansville claimed he knew when Jesus was returning. And he said, one way we would know that Jesus had come was, for those believers who would go to heaven, there would just be clothes for me. He predicted it would be a Sunday, December 7th. So Sunday, December 7th came along, and there was no return of Jesus. After church, I got this impish idea in my mind. I thought, I think I'll go to our collection of clothes for the poor and go around town and drop like a skirt and blouse and pair of shoes in a parking lot and a man's pair of pants and shirt and shoes on a corner somewhere. And somebody with his clothes in front of a beauty project. Oh, look, those people must have gone to heaven with Jesus. But I decided poor people needed the clothes more. But for some reason, especially here in America, and that's the only thing I can deal with is because it's the only place I've ever lived, we have this fascination of trying to outsmart Jesus. We have this fascination with trying to say, we know more than what the Bible says. 
And so there's always these people coming up and when Jesus is going to return. Totally ignoring what Jesus has to say. So as we look at our gospel lesson this morning, the opening portion of the gospel lesson is Jesus predicting the fall of Jerusalem. That's why he says many of this generation will not die before this happens. And in 70 AD, the Romans came and destroyed the temple in the city of Jerusalem. And then we pick up with verse 32, and I don't know how simpler Jesus can make it. How any more he can explain what is so obvious and how people misunderstand. But we've had this happen in the church throughout its history. We go along and everything's fine and then suddenly the church decides it needs to do something to add to Christianity. We can't just take Jesus at his word that we are saved by grace through faith apart from works of the law. No, we got to pile on some other demand, like Seventh-day Adventists. There's no alcohol, no uh, tobacco, no car playing, and a bunch of restrictions. Those don't do anything to help your salvation. Your salvation comes through believing in the sacrificial death of Jesus upon the cross and his resurrection and ascension. That's it. But we always want to add things. But listen to what Jesus says. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now how simpler can you make it? No one knows. That word knows means to be aware, to perceive something, to understand it, to perceive it with your outward senses. So Jesus is saying, no one will know when I'm returning. Sure, there's going to be wars, and there's going to be rumors of wars, and there's going to be natural disasters, and there's going to be man-made disasters, and there's going to be all kinds of craziness. But only my Father knows when I will return. Jesus is speaking in his humanity. Now, there were times when Jesus could have used his divinity in situations, but he didn't in order to identify more with us. There are other times when he uses divinity, like when he raised people, or when he turned water into wine, or he fed 5,000 with a few loaves of fish. But in this case, he's speaking from his humanity. As Jesus Christ, Son of Man, he had no idea when he would return. And yet so many people want to focus on that, waste their time on trying to figure it out. You know, we've had movies and books made about the return of Jesus and, and what would happen. And they become popular for a while and, and then they disappear. You know, the Left Behind series back in the 90s, that was so popular. I was talking to somebody one time about that who was a big proponent of it. And I said, now you're telling me from watching that movie, you're telling me that a God who loved us so much, he sent his only son to die for us, is going to sit there and let planes fall out of the sky and cars run into each other and boats collide because the captain or the driver is going to be a Christian, but the other people aren't, and so they're going to all die in this horrible crash because the Christian got raptured up into heaven and everybody else left behind. I said, I don't buy it. The God that loved me so much to let his son down on a cross and go through all that horrible suffering and death is not going to have people just disappear from flying planes, driving boats, cars, buses, trains, whatever. But that's what we get all hepped up on and focus on, wasting all the church's time on when's Jesus coming again? Instead of doing what Jesus is telling us to do, in our gospel lesson for today. So, what else does he say? Nobody knows. Then he says, be on guard. That is, keep awake. That means be awake, keep your eyes open, uh, be alert. Uh, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man, Jesus, going on a journey, his ascension, when he leaves home and puts his servants, brothers and sisters in Christ, 
in charge, each with his own work and commands, deeds and labor within the church. The doorkeeper, church leaders, to stay, command to stay awake, refrain from sleep or to pay attention. Here is the important part of what Jesus is saying, is that we are to be awake doing what he has called us to do. We are to focus our time and energy, not on when he's coming again, but on spreading the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to spend our time and energy in supporting the ministries of the church, whether it's local church, national church, international church. Supporting those efforts that spread the good news so that those who have not heard the good news of the gospel have an opportunity to hear it and an opportunity to be saved through believing in Jesus Christ. Therefore, stay awake. That is, don't be caught napping. If you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. That is, be vigilant. Be watchful. Remain alert to proclaim the gospel and to practice your faith. And that's where the sleep comes in. There is a danger, because Jesus has not returned, for us to fall asleep in our faith. And what do I mean by that? I mean, we stop supporting the ministries of the church. We stop sharing the gospel with those who have not heard it. We stop making the church a priority. We say, well, Jesus hadn't come in all these years. He's not going to come while I'm alive, so I can just slack off from now until I get older. And then when I get older, maybe I'll start going back to church. Maybe I'll start supporting the, uh, the ministries of the church again. But like Jesus says, that's a foolish way of thinking because we have no idea when he will come. The trumpet will sound, the heavens will open, the angels will descend, and the Son of God will come. We don't know when. We don't know what will happen. And so we are to be working. And we are not to fall asleep in our faith. We are not to stop doing what Jesus has commanded us to do. And what was that command before he ascended? Go therefore into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. To go to every nation. Now some would say, oh, but you can't convert Muslims. So we shouldn't put any energy. Well, when I was in seminary, there was a young pastor from Tanzania and predominant church in Tanzania is the Lutheran church because Tanzania when it was known as Tanganyika was a colony of Germany and so of course Germany brought Lutheranism to Tanganyika which is now Tanzania and back in those days when I was in seminary the old LCA had a program where they would after a African pastors served a couple years in a parish, they would bring them over to America, to an American seminary, so they could take courses in American seminary that they weren't able to take in their African seminary. Because a lot of those seminaries were still young and didn't have professors in every field that was needed. I don't think we do it anymore because the African seminaries now are so advanced that some of the best the theological work is coming out of Africa now. Uh, but anyhow, at that time, this program uh, was in place, and he was telling us his life story. And he told us how he started out as a teacher in a school. And he had a knack for converting Muslims. And I'm not talking about one or two Muslims in 10 years. I'm talking about one or two Muslims every other day or every day. And so people in his church began to notice it. And they asked him, they said, you have this wonderful ability to convert Muslims to the Christian faith. 
you sure the Holy Spirit isn't calling you to be a pastor? And he had never thought about that. And so he prayed about it. And he felt the Holy Spirit leading him to become a pastor in the Lutheran Church of Tanzania. And that's how I met him. And one day we were talking and he was trying to encourage me that when I got ordained to go to Tanzania and take a parish in Tanzania. And he almost had me convinced. Now, when, we were, when he was doing this and I was just recently married, we had our first child. And uh, well, I'd be kind of interested to go to Africa. He almost convinced me until the day he told me he was chased back into town that he was talking about me to go to by a line. When he said a line chasing back in town, I cut off any ideas of going to Africa. I said, you got to worry about lions chasing you. That's a no place for me. But see, the point is, he as a teacher was doing the work of Jesus. And that's what we're doing. Not focusing on when Jesus is coming in. That's not important. It's important is that we reach every person we can with the good news of the gospel. To be alert, to be awake. One Sunday morning, a little girl asked her Sunday school teacher, she'd gone to the 8 o'clock service, she said, teacher, what's alert? And the teacher said, what? She said, what's alert? And the teacher said, honey, why do you ask? And the little girl responded, she said, well, the pastor this morning says we need to be alert, and I just wanted to know what one was so I could become one. You know, it's not be alert, it's be alert, be awake, don't be called out, be ready. So we're always to look for an opportunity to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the church has been plagued with people who think Jesus is coming again now, and so they quit doing it. And this is as old as the beginning of the church. Let me remind you of Paul and his experience with the church of the Thessalonians. Paul goes and visits the church of the Thessalonians, and what does he discover? <clears throat> but there are Christians in the community who are sitting around doing nothing because they think Jesus is returning, so they are living off all the other Christians who are still working. So Paul sends them a second letter. And this is what he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning with verse 10. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing good. That is, don't become discouraged, don't become desperate, uh, don't become weak or, or have feeling of failure or feebleness, but instead live virtuous. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother or sister in Christ. So, there is no excuse for sitting around and doing that. We are to be worthy. We are to be doing the work of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ each and every day. He is the man who has gone on the journey. We are the servants whom he has given jobs to do. And that job is to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when you talk about the second coming, oftentimes people become afraid. But we should not be afraid. We should look forward to the return of our Lord. But being busy while we wait. During the presidential election of 1960, then Senator John F. Kennedy from Massachusetts oftentimes ended speeches with the story of Colonel Davenport. Colonel Davenport was the Speaker of the House of Representatives 
for the state of Connecticut. And one day in 1780, they were meeting in Hartford, Connecticut, and the sky suddenly became very ominous, very strange color, darkness. One exactly black, one exactly gray, and almost purple. And a lot of the representatives began to panic and move for adjournment, saying, this must be the end of time. Uh, uh, we need to adjourn so we can go home. Colonel Davenport rose and he said these words, quote, the day of judgment is either approaching or it is not. If it is not, there is no cause for adjournment. If it is, I choose to be found doing my duty. Therefore, I wish that candles be brought in the world. Rather than fearing the return of Jesus, we should be praying for the return of Jesus. And like Colonel David, be found doing our duty. Be found being at work. Being found spreading the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we watch because we do not know when Jesus is coming. But as we watch, we continue to work. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds to Christ Jesus. Amen. Now I ask that you turn to the back of your bulletin as we sing the hymn of Redeem. This hymn, Redeemed, was written by Fanny J. Crosby, and she was a, a blonde hymn writer in the 1800s. She wrote many, many hymns. This is one of her hymns, Redeemed. <laughs> Eternally begotten of the Father, 
God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the cross. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Our response today is hear our prayer. Lord, you have given us the stars as markers of days and seasons, and we thank you for bringing us to the beginning of a new church year. Keep us faithful as we move through its observances and celebrations. May we gather often to hear the proclamation of your Son and receive the gifts you so freely bestow upon us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We do not know the time the Son of Man will come. That knowledge belongs only to you, O Lord. Keep us wakeful, watchful, and ever ready for his arrival, so that we, along with all your faithful people, may be gathered from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all nations, as we await the full coming of your promised kingdom, be with all who make, administer, and judge our laws. May they use the authority that you have given them wisely and according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, you are our Father. Hide not your face from us. Look with kindness, especially upon all who cry out to you in time of need. According to your will, give healing to the sick, comfort to those who mourn, and perseverance for those who suffer for the sake of your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, even as we await your coming in glory, you come to us in the here and now, in the bread and wine that is the body and blood of your Son. May all who approach your table today receive the sacrament worthily, so that with sins forgiven and strength of faith strengthened, your people lack no gift as they await the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember with thankfulness all the faithful who have gone before us and who are now with you. Preserve and sustain us until the end, so that we will all be presented guiltless before you in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now time for our offering. St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. This is our 1030 service. Helen Wallace and Sharon Leach are the ushers today. Steve Clark is the communion assistant. Linda Smith was the reader and Becky Dimitrov the worship assistant. We welcome you to come anytime to St. John's Lutheran. At 8 o'clock we have our 8 o'clock service every Sunday and 1030 service uh, at every Sunday. This is our 1030 service. At 9.15 is Sunday school. We have classes for children and we have classes for adults. We thank you for worshiping with us today. This is the first Sunday of Advent, December the 3rd, 2017. We have the candle of the prophets that the first Sunday of Advent, there'll be one candle that every Sunday 
as we light the candle to welcome the Messiah, Jesus Christ, be born. We celebrate that the 24th Christmas Eve. We invite you to come here Christmas Eve to worship with us. Flowers on the chancel stand are given to the glory of God. Janet Hogue, in memory of her mother, Margaret Hughes, Pastor and Gina, in honor of Matt and Sarah Pollock's 10 year wedding anniversary. These are the candles, these are the flowers on the chancel stands that you see today. We welcome you to St. John's Lutheran anytime we're at the corner of Wittenberg and Columbia. Call the church office for any more details that you need. We have we receive Holy Communion today. Flesh. 
Shalom. Awaken your people. Fill us with your light. Bring the gift of peace on earth. Come, Holy Spirit. All praise and glory are yours, the Holy One of Israel, the Word of God and common, power of the Most High, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus calls us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. This hymn, My Lord, What a Morning, is an African-American spiritual who is saved from uh, being lost by Fisk University. There were just a few slaves who were singing these songs, but Fisk University sponsored a tour through the United States to find these songs, and this is one of them, My Lord, What a Morning. This university, Nashville, Tennessee, saved these hymns from African American spirituals, or they we would never have them.
for watching our 1030 service on YouTube, December the 3rd, 2017, the first Sunday of Advent. We invite you to come worship with us all the Sundays of Advent and also on Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve service is one of the highlights of the church year. We invite you to come and worship with us anytime, especially on during Advent as we're praying, we're asking for forgiveness of our sins, we're lighting the Advent wreath, we're following all the traditions and things that you can remember of the church many times in your childhood, and probably the highlight would be Christmas Eve. We thank you for watching. We invite you to come worship with us. St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio.